Um, my name is Geeta Sen, and it's my great uh, pleasure and privilege on behalf of Development Alternatives with Women for a New Era, DAWN, and the Pacific Network on Globalization, PANG, uh, to uh, welcome you all to this um, uh, event here this evening. Um, we may still have a few people trickling in, um, and uh, so if that happens, we'll just see, but we're going to get started um, on India time, Fiji time, <laughs> whatever it is. Um, um, I also just want to um, put in a little caveat. Many of you were probably invited by and know Claire Slatter very well. Well, it's clear I'm not Claire Slatter. <laughs> Unfortunately, Claire, who would otherwise have moderated this event, had some urgent family um, event that she had to um, leave for. Um, so I'm stepping in in her place. I'm Dawn's general co-coordinator, along with Maria Graciela Cuervo, who's um, the other um, co-coordinator from the Dominican Republic. Uh, for those of you who don't know um, Dawn, let me just say a few words about us, and then I'm sure when Maureen uh, speaks, she can say a little bit more about Pang um, as well. Um, Dawn um, was established Back, way back in 1984. We are a southern feminist network um, that works in all regions of the south. Uh, we work largely globally and regionally um, and work in collaboration with partner organizations at the national level as and where appropriate. We are a feminist network and we believe very strongly that gender equality and women's human rights have to be part of any move towards any form of justice, economic, social, um, political or cultural. Um, and that, but we also believe that gender equality um, is not possible without just and fair development, um, certainly in our contexts. Um, as we have t said right from the beginning, we're not interested in an equal share of a poisoned pie. Um, so if the pie is poisoned, what's the point of having an equal share in it? If development is not right, uh, for everybody and certainly for the poorest, most vulnerable and most marginal people in our context, many of whom, as we know, are women and girls, then we certainly don't want an equal share of that. We want to change the nature of development um, and we will work and do work for gender justice and women's and girls' human rights in the context of that changing approach to development. That makes us quite different from a lot of other feminist organizations that are largely concerned with the idea of equality per se. Um, but that's been our URL, so to speak, right from the get-go um, 30 plus years. Um, ago. Um, our work encompasses um, 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 a number of major themes, including the political economy of globalization and political ecology and sustainability. Um, these are two of our four major themes. And the work that we're doing with PANG, in collaboration with PANG, on the blue economy. Um, um, in fact, crosses over both of those, uh, both of those um, themes. Um, our concerns here are particularly that in the fierce new world that we live in today, um, of a world of huge inequalities, as we all know, of both wealth and income, and almost limitless and growing corporate power, um, in which ways do we think about 
um, and contend with the forces of both globalization and the use of natural resources and quite often meaning the spoliation of natural resources um, in ways that might actually lead to transformation. And as we know, putting these two together, any one of them by itself is big enough. Putting the two together means that we're in a cauldron of a boiling, bubbling pot with so many actors, um, forces, issues, and contentions um, uh, all over that, in fact, um, it's an enormous challenge. For Dawn, the P this work comes together particularly in the current context because we have a strong theme and line of work on public-private partnerships and the relationship between public-private partnerships and the expansion of corporate control and corporate domination. So in that context, um, this work on the blue economy that Dawn and Pang have begun doing together um, over the last, I would say, about year or a little over a year, maybe two years, it feels shorter uh, than that, uh, about two years ago, has um, a multiple dimensions to it. Um, but certainly interrogating the blue economy itself and, um, and um, looking at how we may in fact deal with what seems to be everyone's current panacea for the oceans um, is a major concern uh, for us. Now it's interesting when we think about the oceans in this context, um, and I hesitate to speak in the presence of Professor Holland, the climate expert, but I just want to make a couple of points about this. If you speak about sort of big picture events that affect the planet, the globe, and so on, if, and you were to ask anybody, including even school children, um, what's the one thing that you think is the, is the big challenge? And they would say the climate. That's of course if you're not in the United States and have had your brain eaten up by climate deniers. Uh, but almost anywhere else in the, in the world, they would say that. Um, and the question is, um, in what way are the oceans, um, are the oceans almost like the climate? Certainly they haven't, um, concern around the oceans has not reached at the global level the same levels of concern that we all uh, have or profess about the climate. And obviously climate and oceans, um, as we know, are very closely, um, closely connected. But there are two or three things which I think make the oceans bid fair to become almost like the climate and climate change um, in, um, in the current uh, global context. The first is, of course, both are about the commons. These are commons that are not easy to manage and certainly are not private in the, in the ways in which they exist and the ways in which they impact on people. But both of them really have strong elements of impact from the pressures of privatization. Um, whether we're talking about the private privatization of fossil fuels and energy and production and so on, on the one side, or on the side of the oceans, whether we're talking about private fishing and private mining and so on, a lot of which, of course, we'll be talking about today. So both are commons, and as commons, both have governability issues that are very large. Um, and those governability issues in fact are quite interestingly similar if we think about what goes on on land and what goes on in the oceans. The shift from small scale community managed uh, production to private property and then to for profit interests on a big scale have meant that there's a public policy challenge of corporate capture and the regulation of corporate capture the corporate capture of regulatory authorities 
And here I would say certainly we know that that's a challenge in the context of the climate. Is it also a challenge in the context of the oceans? And this is something I think um, in thinking about and talking about the International Seabed Authority, for instance, that some people would put a question mark around how independent um, that authority uh, may be. So the governability question is there. The third one is that both have large, uncertain, and unstable effects. We actually really don't know, and we don't, with all the science and all that we know about the climate um, up to now, we still keep learning, and we still keep finding the instability and the uncertainty around um, climate impacts um, and I think that the oceans we're going to find are very similar um, to that. And the last one is, of course, the impact on livelihoods of vulnerable people, including, uh, from our particular context, uh, women um, uh, as well. Uh, those impacts are significant and large, and the, um, and the harmful effects of climate change as with harmful effects of, um, uh, of, the, um, of oceans change, if I may call it that, um, may be exactly similar in, the, in terms of the effects on very vulnerable people, and they're the ones who are likely to suffer the most. I think in, this, in that thinking about the oceans in that context, um, has certainly helped me to realize that, oh my God, this is as though we didn't have one, this is another one that's going to be and could well be just as large as that. That, of course, and those discussions and the complexities of those debates, as well as the challenges around un not just understanding, but also figuring out what we do about them both in terms of regulation, but also in terms of civil society action, of advocacy, of mobilization, the actions of, um, uh, of academics and of research. How do we, what and how do we do in taking, um, in taking this forward? So what I'm gonna do today, we have a terrific lineup of speakers, um, and I'm gonna do very brief introductions of all of them, uh, right here at the beginning so that I don't keep popping in and out like a Jill in the box. Um, and then at the, each of them is going to be speaking for about 15 minutes. After the first three speakers, we will have a spoken word by Tyler Ray Chung, who is where? Somewhere. There, yes. Um, thank you. And then we'll have the other two speakers. The speakers are not exactly in that order. Maureen is going to be speaking right at the end, but we are in, otherwise we will follow that order. So let me just give you a brief um, introduction to, uh, to the speakers. Um, the first speaker is Marioni Chung, who is, the, who is Dawn's program officer. Um, and has been um, key to Dawn's contribution to the Dawn Pang um, collaboration on the blue economy. She's an active member of Fiji's human rights community, holds a BA from the University of the South Pacific, and a master's from ANU. Our next speaker is Dr. Hugh Govan, who is currently an adjunct senior fellow at USP School of Government, Development and International Affairs, and continuing his 18-year role as an advisor to the locally managed marine area network in Asia and the Pacific. His work with LMMA uh, network has focused on extending community-driven approaches to resource management from the Pacific into becoming a global phenomenon, increasingly paying attention to factors such as rights and policy that might best ensure that local fishers are empowered to sustain their livelihoods in coastal areas. He's co-author of the region's overarching oceans policy, the framework for a Pacific oceanscape, as well as SPC and MSG fisheries strategies and PNG's roadmap for coastal fisheries. 
Our third speaker is Professor Elizabeth Holland, who's the director of the Pacific Center for Environment and Sustainable Development, PACE-SD, and the University of the South Pacific's Professor of Climate Change. Professor Holland is passionate about working collaboratively with communities to support climate resilient development practices that protect the health of the Pacific's big ocean states. The PACE SD team has worked in 120 communities in 15 Pacific Island countries to establish a locally managed climate change adaptation network. And Professor Holland, as you undoubtedly know, is internationally recognized for her work in the Earth system. She is author of four of the five uh, IPCC reports, um, having served as a US, German, and Fiji representative at different points, and a co-recipient of the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize for her contribution to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, she is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences, Leopold Fellow, and led USP's delegation to support Pacific governments in negotiating. The Paris Agreement has served as a professor at the Max Planck Institute for Biogeochemistry in Germany and senior scientist and leader of the Interdisciplinary Biogeosciences Program at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado in the USA. We're delighted that she could join us um, today as well. Um, our um, fourth speaker is Dr. Francis Koya Bakauta. Francis is director of the Oceania Center for Arts, Culture, and Pacific Studies at the Faculty of Arts, Law, and Education here at USB, a teacher by profession. She's worked in the area of teacher education, curriculum development, education for sustainable development, education for SIDS, and culture and education at USP since 1998. She's passionate about Pacific art, heritage, and indigenous knowledge systems, and has worked in the areas of policy writing, community development, indigenous research approaches, Pacific research ethics and cultural competency. An artist and poet working under the lovely pseudonym One Angry Native. Her work explores Pacific Island heritage and contemporary issues in the island. And our fifth speaker is Maureen Penjueli, who's a dedicated activist having pursued environmental, social, and economic justice issues for over 20 years throughout the region. She's currently coordinator of PANG, the Pacific Network on Globalization, a leading regional NGO working on trade and economic justice issues. PANG's work involves research, lobbying, and advocacy with and on behalf of civil society groups, faith-based organizations, communities, and customary landowners. And Last but not least, let me introduce our spoken word speaker, Tyler Ray Chung, who's an aspiring young Fijian marine conservationist. She's a recent graduate of the University of the South Pacific, a youth advo advocate with Wantok Moana, a member of the Pacific Youth Council Network, and engages with various Pacific youth-led initiatives to call attention to Pacific people's priorities. As I said, each of them will be speaking for 15 minutes. I'll give you each a two-minute waving of my piece of paper and a zero-minute, okay, time's up uh, notice. So let's welcome. So let's try and surface some of these ocean agendas tonight. The blue economy represents an array of interests that I find a bit worrying. This evening, I will share with you what some of these worries are. And as we have been enticed back into our oceans, we need to become more aware of the undercurrents of the agendas and economic wish lists that float to our shores. I want to red flag this overt development paradigm, the blue economy. 
as it could possibly drown us. Where did this language come from? Why does it occupy so much of our development plans now? Is it taking over our development priorities? And what are the implications to consider? Firstly, we are oceanic people. And the Pacific Oceans is part of our lives, our culture, and our development story now and forevermore. However, globally, the ocean's health is key to life on this planet and to human activities. Also, as resources on land run scarce, oceans are among the last frontiers of natural resources, now seemingly up for the taking under blue growth. In its origins, the idea of a blue economy gained major traction during the UN Conference on Sustainable Development. In build-up to Rio Plus 20 in 2012, the Pacific Small Island Developing States, PSIDS, led the momentum to acceptance of the idea of blue economy. They emphasized the economic sites of island states as economic dependent communities, and the concept coincides with the framing of the Pacific as large ocean states. Following on the green economy, the blue economy introduced oceans to the purview of sustainable development action. And now everybody is here, riding the global ocean waves into our backyards. The blue economy agenda, though, has lent a lot of attention to the importance of oceans, to the economic, political, social, and more importantly, environmental aspirations of our time. For small island developing states, SIDS, it has called further attention to the vulnerability of our island environments, to climate change impacts, and to ocean health. This has been toted simultaneously with economic potentials of oceans, with the oceans as real sites for intensive and expansive economic activities. As a result, since Rio Plus 20, we now have a standalone goal on oceans under the SDGs, and the span of, blue economy, of the blue economy framework is, in fact, extends beyond oceans to other bodies of waters like lakes, rivers, and seas. But kudos to our Pacific leaders for this massive initiative, which acknowledges and embraces the contribution of oceans. But now that we have the world's attention, can we manage the ups and downs of divergent interests? Do we all mean the same thing when we say blue economy? Various definitions put forward by very different actors suggest some convergence in aspirations to ensure that balance between economic benefits and ocean health. Interestingly, the World Bank, FAO, Pacific regional bodies, Pacific governments and other governments, financial investors like Credit Suisse, and Goldman Sachs, military, military tech giants like Lockheed Martin, and environmental NGOs such as WWF and Conservation International are all saying very similar language, are all using very similar language to define blue economy. It's with some broad combination of economic benefits with sustainable long-term ocean health. Parts of the private pro for-profit sector, like tourism, fisheries, aquaculture, also echo this. But how come? How come the World Bank, WWF, the finance interests, the economists and governments are all saying the same thing? Do we now have a perfect matching of interests, concerns and realities? Across private sectors, governments, conservation groups and academics, is there really no conflict of interest in the blue growth? Rather than opposing interests and contradictory dynamics, blue growth envisions triple benefit solutions, where everybody supposedly wins. Ocean communities, the environment, and the investors. Or are there things that hide behind broad asp aspirational language that allows interested parties to carry on pursuing their own self-interests. Is the devil in the details of blue growth? In other words, is this a smoke and mirrors game? 
In contrast to the triple benefit view, the World Forum of Fisher People and scholar activists charge the blue economy with being a global ocean grab. The World Forum of Fisher People charges multinational corporations, environmental NGOs, speculative investors, and many others as pushing a power grab to gain control of aquatic blue resources. WFFP sees blue economy as, and I quote, the capturing of control by powerful economic actors of crucial decision making, including the power to decide how and who and for what purposes marine resources are used, conserved, and managed. As a result of these powerful actors, whose main concern is making a profit, they are steadily gaining control of both the aquatic resources and the benefits of their use. This critique makes it clear that the ambivalence of the blue economy framework reflects basic tensions in sustainable development between exploiting natural resources for profit and those concerned with prioritizing the integrity of the ecosystems. Drawing on this insight, I want to make three points this evening. The first one, the language of economy attached to blue already highlights the economic over the social, marginalizing the importance of culture, traditional systems and knowledge, environment and rights of nature. Perhaps contained in the success of Pacific states in promoting our oceanscape have been the seeds of its possible subversion and co-optation by economic interests and dominant economic forces. My second point is, submerged in the language of blue economy are different, very different sectors. Tourism, coastal and deep fisheries, aquaculture, transportation, seabed mining, pharmaceuticals, energy. These economic activities do not have the same effects, either on the ocean health or people's livelihoods. For instance, seabed mining is hiding in the midst of tourism and fisheries, and the sustainable efforts that we lend to these two sectors. Seabed mining appears to be getting a free pass under the idea of blue growth. We need to distinguish sources and sites of livelihoods from other sectors, like deep sea mining and big states' interests. We must challenge the scope of blue economy here in the Pacific so that the cost of some sectors on the environment do not undermine the real sustainability of other ocean sectors like fisheries and tourism. The ocean sectors where people are heavily involved in and where women are heavily situated in. 97% of fisher folk are in developing countries with women playing a significant role in production, distribution and manufacturing. And the question of food sovereignty is critical here. My final point, the third point, the concept of blue growth was taken largely uncritically from the idea of green growth. But the green economy has been widely critiqued, particularly with regards to market-based environmentalism that price tags nature and suggests that the marketplace is the best, is, will best protect the environment. A similar critique of the blue economy, while incipient, has been slow to take off. The commodification of ocean resources regurgitates green growth's approach of market-based environmentalism. That determines the value of nature in the priority of market interests. In 2015, WWF estimated the economic value of the oceans at 24 trillion US dollars, making it the seventh largest economy in the world. WWF carried out a similar valuation in the Pacific and price tagged our Melanesian Ocean and coastline economy at 548, US, 548 billion US dollars. The EU says the blue economy represents 5.4 million European jobs and generates a gross added value of 500 billion euros a year for them making the ocean and its resources a formidable space to control. 
The EU's blue growth strategy in 2017 states, and I quote, the output of the global ocean economy is ex estimated at 1.3 trillion euros today, and this could more than double in 2030. The EU has made, made clear that it should not miss this opportunity, unquote. Under the rubric of blue economy, the temptation to view the oceans as a private economic resource becomes very great. We, the Pacific, may be tempted to forfeit ocean health for economic wealth. Uncritically using green growth's market-based approaches to conservation. For instance, carving up the ocean areas over here for mineral exploitation and other areas over there for marine life protection. Despite the Pacific Despite the blue economy's claim for win-win opportunities for all, there will be winners and losers at the local level, as well at the, as the planetary level. The claims of fisher people, of women who bear the burdens of ensuring livelihoods and care for, women, for families and communities in the face of eroding resources need to be investigated by critical research and action. SIDS, especially us, PSIDS, whose peoples have long-standing historical and spiritual connections to and identify with the ocean, as well as depend on for food and security, food security and livelihoods, have an enormous stake in protecting our oceans. We should be at the forefront of this critical view on blue economy to ensure that our, our oceans and islands don't become again a testing ground for private and dominant economic interests under the guise of, defect, of benefiting humankind. Thank you. Okay, so I think uh, Melioni's uh, highlighted some of the issues with the, uh, the monetization or talking about the ocean as, a, as an economy, and I'll dig deeper into that, but I, I'm trying to make it as simple as possible because I, I think we're at risk of losing some of the main points by assuming that it is complicated. I think actually it's staring us in the face. Just um, as a quick review, uh, what, what actually could we be making money out of in the ocean? It's, it's not, there's not a, a large number of things that are unexplored or are, are going to be creating lottery wins for us. Uh, maybe the next slide. Principal among them at the moment is uh, offshore fisheries, oceanic fisheries. Uh, about three um, billion dollars worth of fish are landed from the Pacific in terms of uh, tuna mainly. And the Pacific has managed to capture or manages to capture every year for the islands about uh, half a billion to three quarters of, uh, yeah, three quarters of a billion. Uh, the, there isn't much more potential for more overall value, but there's potential in the offshore fishery for the countries to get more by domestically catching the fish rather than allowing uh, offshore fleets to do so. In coastal fisheries, the situation is the reverse. The, the, the region gets a, a, the very much the lion's share of the value for itself, about uh, just over half a billion, and there's a very small amount of the inshore coastal fisheries are exported. Uh, the, again, there isn't much potential for more catches, but there is potential to, to add more value, particularly because some of the most valuable coastal fisheries, such as Beche de Mer, Trochus, Green Snail, have almost become extinct from over-exploitation. If those can be recovered and managed properly, there would be a lot more money in what is a relatively small resource. And then another, the third of the extractive or non-renewable resources that, that people are talking about in terms of having uh, money potential. Actually, despite the fact we read in the press day after day that, that it's a trillion dollar resource, we actually are not being given very solid figures. They must have them, but we are not being told what, what's in it for them. There is only one study I'm aware of which talks about um, what might be in it for the islands. And in fact, if you look at it carefully, it's tens of millions per year. So, it's, so Cook Islands is told it might get at the most 400 million from its manganese nodules over 20 years. 
So that's not actually so much once you, you do the thumbs. And some of the and that's the maximum figure. That's they were, they were giving you a range that could be probably will be much less than that. Some countries it's not even viable, uh, and so on. So that we can't really say, but it looks very small compared to the other extractive resources. Then on the, the renewable front, the big the big uh, hope for everybody is tourism. It's already worth quite a lot, um, and again, it's hard to calculate, and people aren't sharing a lot of them information, but it is clear that in both the onshore, that is uh, the mass tourism onshore sector and the cruise ship sector, most of the money goes overseas and the big debates are how, how do the islands actually benefit from things like cr cruise tourism, uh, whereas the islands of course actually suffer the consequences of the pollution and so on, the ships leave behind. But those at least are, are renewable resources and we have time to get that right. So overall, if you see it all compared, the, you know, the big fisheries are the, the issues. I didn't really mention about coastal, but of course that's just the, the economic value, the contribution to GDP. But we all know the cultural, the health, the nutritional contributions of coastal fisheries. Many communities are surviving without being part of the cash economy thanks to the health of their coastal fisheries. So um, basically the, the main blue economy in the region depends crucially on the health of the ocean. And to cut a long story short, the management of this ocean at the moment is very bad. There is, you know, we could be polite about it, but essentially there's very little concern for sustainable management of the ocean from the independent countries. Just to dig into the two main fisheries for, for some examples uh, or some hopeful uh, rays of light. In the offshore fisheries, which I mentioned uh, being landed at about three to four billion dollars worth. It's, it's actually worth trillions of, something like, um, how much is it worth? Well, anyway, a lot, lot more once it gets to the supermarkets. But uh, for, for our sakes, uh, the end value, I'll say 20 to 30 billion. Dock value, about three billion. Next slide. And in recent years, after decades of getting a minute fraction of the value of that fishery, something like three to five percent, the parties to the Nauru Agreement has achieved much closer to 25% of the value of that fishery. And that means the countries are getting about half a billion a year in access fees. This is something like 25% of the, the value of the landed fish. Uh, so the, the PNA story is a very uh, interesting one. Next slide. This just illustrates something that I'll bring up later as well. But uh, over the years, although the, the actual value of the fishery stayed more or less the same, in fact, it's the fishing has stabilized at what we consider a kind of sustainable level. The proportion that stays in the countries is a lot more. It's increased very rapidly, but since the formation of the PNA in 2010. And the, 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 again, cutting lots of corners in the story, but essentially this was not a and not, not something that the crop agencies came up with. They're sure they provided data. When I say crop agencies, I mean FFA or SPC or USB or other forum secretariat. But actually, it's a smaller group of countries that share the skipjack tuna resource that after lengthy discussions managed to coordinate. Instead of acting separately with the different distant water fishing nations, they banded together and presented essentially a cartel, a common block and were able to more or less set the rules. So it was a kind of a, a group, a community you could call it. It hadn't worked up until 2010, partly because the community that was trying to do that was actually under the FFA, the Forum Fisheries, and that's a much bigger group. And it includes some of the people that actually don't have skipjack and some of the people who don't really have an interest in the Pacific uh, sustaining its livelihood in this way. The other, the other thing was that the PNA came up with a management approach which was not the best practice advised by the fisheries experts from overseas. It was actually a more practical, slightly less technically correct approach, but it's called the Vessel Day Scheme, which is an effort-based thing. All you need to know is, is the fish in your water, I'm sorry, the fish, the ship in your waters or not? And you sell the days that the ship can access your waters. It means it's very much easier to monitor. You can, anybody can do it with a satellite <laughs> and the overflights. But anyway, it's a lot easier to monitor than whether they're catching uh, 10 or 20 fish or whatever. So those are two things, adapting the, the law of the sea and, and using the appropriate tools and coming together in a sort of collaborative community. Okay, now the, the obvious example from coastal fisheries. Okay, so as I say, something like a half billion, which again is roughly what the offshore fisheries are generating. 
And the question is, why, why haven't coastal fisheries collapsed? Because I can tell you there isn't much government management happening. And the reason is really because of something that a lot of us are taking for granted, uh, but a lot of you have seen in action, and that is customary rights, or the indigenous or traditional rights in the areas. In many countries, customary rights of the sea are not actually contemplated in the law, they're not written down, but you'll see them coming into action when somebody comes into your village waters and starts taking fish beyond a certain proportion that might be considered reasonable. If they start making money out of your waters, somebody will usually paddle up and ask you what you're doing, and then they'll probably be ejected or charge some, some fee or something like that. So in essence, the, the exercising these rights is regulating what would otherwise and everywhere else in the world would be a free-for-all of people coming into village areas. We make a lot, next slide, we make a lot about the NGO work on community-based management, on, on uh, what we call in our network locally managed marine areas, others call other things. But in fact, uh, a very small fraction, these are the number of communities per, per country in the Pacific, a very small fraction, the blue fraction, have received any help in doing community-based management. So more than 90% of villages in the Pacific, in Pacific coastal areas are actually surviving without NGOs help in doing management. They are just using these essentially these rights to exclude people from entering their waters. So, so funnily enough, or I amuse myself at least, drawing the parallels that it's a, again it's the strength of community, that people who know who they are working together, obeying their own rules and acting as a group against outside impositions and using their, their, their traditional knowledge, their, their traditional tools. And again, it didn't really matter that they were the best practice from outside or that they were legally supported. They were basically exercising those rights. But it's, that's, uh, I mean, that's so far so good, but uh, actually the fisheries are in, in great trouble. Clearly, we're talking a very small fraction of the blue that is part of the, the island nations. It's a, a very small part of the waters that we are, are bathed in. And so all of that uh, dependency for health, for nutrition, the half billion I was talking about comes out from that tiny fraction. And of course, the impacts that communities can't handle traditionally or otherwise are the impacts that are coming from development, land-based impacts such as development for tourism, logging, mining, building uh, infrastructure, agriculture, and pollution coming from nutrients associated with agriculture and so on. So that's one big area that we're seeing communities suffering from. And the other one is that communities are very strapped for opportunities for income. And so where there's any valuable species that people overseas would like to buy, usually the uh, communities are being forced into to entering the cash economy and selling them at whatever price is being set by the, the buyers, and they have much less incentive to sustainably manage. So what we find in locally managed marine areas, for example, is that when it is a valuable resource, usually they can't exercise um, the same traditional management that they would for a subsistence resource. So we're, we're clear, we're acknowledging that, and this is where the government has to step in and regulate uh, the market chain, or in the case of land-based impacts, look at what's happening on land. Unfortunately, government's not taking it very seriously. In most countries, especially independent countries, they're not investing anywhere near what you would expect, given the importance of coastal fisheries and offshore fisheries for that matter, but their budgets are very small and they're not particularly increasing, despite uh, all the commitments to blue economy and sustainability. So it's a small amount of one to two or three million dollars that 12 or 13 of the countries actually spend on management. You have to tickle this out from fisheries budgets because a lot of the money going into fisheries is actually for building ice stations, for giving boats out to people, things that actually are putting more pressure on the resources. But that's roughly what we estimate is being spent on management, a tiny amount. And if you look at environment departments who might be in charge of worrying about land-based impacts, they're getting paid even less. And in the case of Fiji, for example, a lot of that money is going on running the, the landfill rather than on actually enforcing environmental regulations. So just to summarize here, you, you, as I mentioned, the, the main blue economy for the Pacific will be these the main things that depend on the health of the ocean, the extractive resources like fisheries and the, the tourism potential. And this outlier, which is deep sea mining, not likely to help us very much, and unworryingly with very unknown impacts. We don't know 
what the impacts of deep sea mining will be. We don't know how climate change is likely to make those impacts better or worse. There are, there's new data coming out every day about biogeochemical cycles and the connectedness that we didn't know existed between the deep sea and the surface. We don't know whether fish like swimming over mines or not, but yeah, it would probably be better not to find out the, the hard way. Okay, so this is not, this is just some things to throw to, to, to you, but basically one thing we, we might want to think about is how would you tell if government is doing anything that we would expect to do with the blue economy? Well, one easy thing to measure is it's not 20 cents on plastic bags, spoiler alert. Uh, it would be what is the budget, what are they investing from our regular taxes from the, from the budget every year in things that are actually politically very unpopular, like telling people not to catch small fish or regulating the, the, the quantity that you can catch or checking out what they're selling in the market and telling them off when they're undersized and so on. So those are the things that we don't, we don't see getting funded but are vital for government to play its part in sustainability. And another point there too is that quite often the environmental uh, agencies not only are being underfunded but they're being interfered with. So we would expect to see environment authorities that are, are independent or ring fenced in some way from political, uh, um, how do you call it, maybe interference is, is the correct word, but essentially something, something that could actually stand up and do its job regardless of the interests of the minister or of developers. So as I say, it's very clear, we could go into it much further, that resource management is not being carried out very well. So it seems ludicrous to, to expand our extractive activities into the ocean when they fail so abysmally on land and our, and our resources are not being managed in the sea. And in that vein, I just thought that I'd suggest and maybe jump into <laughs> Maureen's talk or whatever, but there is talk in the International Seabed Authority today in Jamaica that a 10-year moratorium would be a good idea on deep sea mining because of these unknowns, because it's not clear, not even clear whether we will get any of the money from it. We know that the companies think it's a great idea, but we are not being given conclusive arguments. And even if the money came to countries, would it be distributed or would it be put in sovereign wealth funds? We don't have this information. So I think we should back the cause, and it's ironic that it's the cause of African countries at the moment for a moratorium, because somehow the Pacific is very silent on the 10-year moratorium. Maybe you should check who's actually participating and talking in Jamaica. Anyway, thank you. <laughs> the previous speakers have been extraordinary, and I'm in extraordinary company, and I'm a scientist in love with numbers. But what's in my head tonight is that I've come to you from my office by the sea to have a crisis of contradictions. Because as I look down at my notebook, I see a notebook from the American Embassy. I am a US citizen, but I feel like a citizen of the sea. And so that's one of my crises of contradictions. I listened to my biography and I thought, that doesn't feel like what gives me happiness. What gives me happiness is actually paddling in the evening so that I can process all of the stuff that's accumulated in my day. So how do I hold all of these things because as a scientist, I love numbers. As a scientist, I believe in the wonder of science. I believe in science for solutions. That's what I was recognized for as a AAAS fellow in which I received a small rosette. I traveled all the way to Washington, D.C. to receive a small pin that looks like nothing, except that it gives that scientific enterprise status. So I can walk around with my NASA is 50 year old pen, my American embassy notebook, but what have I done? Have I given myself happiness? Have I given anything solutions? So, um, in keeping with my focus on numbers, you all have heard me tell about the numbers that we're facing, that we're looking at 
We've already got 20 centimeters. We're looking at one meter of sea level rise with the possibility of three meters of sea level rise. You know from Winston the destructive power of that. Could you give me the next slide, please? And I think back to the first time I had deep discussions about the blue economy, except I wanted to call it the blue-green economy because blue and green together are my favorite color, turquoise. So that's what I said at the PIDF, and I still think that, you can tell. Um, so at the PIDF and beyond, Faye Tevi talked about why the UN pillars of society, economy, and environment fail us when we're talking about sustainable development. He talked about to have a healthy economy, one that's sustainable, that honors our principles, that's not this commodification of ecosystem services. We need the economy held by a collective society that works together, held by a healthy environment. And I think about that on an almost everyday basis. And when I represent the Pacific at places, I keep trying to remind them that. But I feel a little bit like trying to gain voice in an abusive relationship. Next slide, please. So these sustainable development goals build on the Millennium Development Goals. The Millennium Development Goals gave us 70 coal-fired power plants a day in Africa, in India. If you look at the emissions track, the Millennium Development Goals sold to us by people now pushing the Sustainable Development Goals gave us the fastest rising CO2 emissions that we ever experienced. Is that a diplomatic success? As so many claim. And so we're here now, we're focused on sustainable development goals that begin to focus on what we hold most dear, our ocean. And how can we transform that power to make sure that that pie is not poisoned? I don't know. But I know I came to the Pacific through the land of turquoise, through the Navajo Nation. And I stood up to Peabody Coal. I stood up to the Salt River Mine. I helped drive horse trailers in support of horse protests crossing the Navajo Nation. And that's where I learned to try to combine my science with something else, to really serve society. But last week, Peabody, you remember John Denver songs, Peabody Coal? Peabody decided to shut down the coal mines on the Navajo Nations. In my crisis of contradictions, I should be celebrating. But I also know at the same time, that's the economy. That's what gives people food. We're stopping the exploitation of groundwater back to water. But with what? With ripping the heart and soul out of something that the Navajos were trying to use to at least bring some collective good to their societies? I don't know whether that feels right. I began to think about this on a visit to Rotuma. Because when I went to Rotuma, I found a boat fueling facility. And you could see it being reclaimed year by year. And I looked at the history of the pictures of that fueling facility, and I thought, someone built this to do good, but it's not doing good. And the 
it's being reclaimed, but how do we help the people that depended on that? And I don't know the answers to this. So, thus my crisis of contradictions. Next slide, please. So, you heard in my bio, I came as an internationally recognized Earth system scientist. I thought about carbon and I thought about nitrogen. When I came to the Pacific, I thought, what is my knowledge useful for? How can I transform it into something useful in my numbers game? So if we look at this, this is the carbon budget for our planet. 34.4 gigatons of carbon dioxide are coming out of fossil fuels into the atmosphere. 4.8 gigatons of carbon dioxide are coming from land use change, that sort of harvesting of our land. Already, our ocean is providing services and removing 8.8 .8 gigatons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to remove it from playing an active role in forcing the climate system. Next slide, please but it comes at a cost. It comes at the cost of changing the acidity of our oceans. That changing acidity of our oceans compromise our coral reefs, compromise the ability of those coral reefs to form, to protect us, to provide the stability to absorb 90% of our wave energy. Next slide, please. So, if I take the next step, and I commodify those numbers. I come up with some interesting figures. Next slide, please. If I look at the carbon budgets of the Melanesian countries alone, you know, we talk, talk, talk about being less than one or less than 3% of the contributors to emissions. You know what? We're wrong. Our net carbon emissions are minus 36 teragrams, minus 71 teragrams, minus 31 teragrams, minus 16 teragrams. We are absorbing more carbon dioxide than we are emitting. If you consider just the forests on a net carbon basis, we are absorbing more carbon dioxide than we are emitting. Next slide, please. So, in my love of numbers, I've come up with some numbers. So the ocean sink, as you saw in the previous slides, is 8.8 .8 petagrams of carbon dioxide per year. So, the newest way to commodify carbon is to include the social cost of carbon at 57 USD per ton. That's 502 billion USD per year, 25,080 billion USD over 50 years. So these numbers swamp the numbers that were presented by Hugh. For the EEZ of the Pacific Island countries and territories, we're looking at 40 billion USD per year. So that's the cost of the service that we're providing to the world. And I think back to that original PIDF where I advocated for blue-green carbon because it was my favorite color. Or blue-green economies because it was my favorite color. You know, I'm a scientist, so I should be advocating for a little bit more than that. But Sitavini Halapua said at that PIDF meeting, he said, we are providing aid to the entire planet just in our fish alone. So I say that we are providing aid to the entire planet just in our carbon dioxide absorption alone. Next slide, please. So tomorrow morning, I'll get on a plane. I'll emit CO2, 
and I'll participate in international processes. And I'm gonna go get cold. Because I will land in Kazan, Russia to participate in the fourth lead author meeting of this IPCC Special Report on Oceans and Cryosphere. In my crisis of contradictions, is it worth it? Is it worth it for me to represent the research of the Pacific in a special report that it took us 30 years to get? Is it worth it for me to go there and advocate for the ocean's pathway in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change that's not giving us the solutions we need? I'm not sure, but I'm gonna go because I don't know what else to do. And I finally got a plane ticket yesterday. And the guy in the Russian visa office that helped me do the impossible and get a visa gave me a Russian cookies when I gave him an orange. So, you know, that act of human kindness sort of was like the last straw. I guess I gotta go. So, but what I really wanna do is I wanna use science from the Pacific for the Pacific to provide solutions to the Pacific and to us as part of the Pacific. So what I really wanna do is not do an international assessment I want to gather with you. I want to gather with Jale. Because I just got the best news a professor can ever get yesterday. Because he will graduate as our first PhD student from the climate change program, and he's going to graduate with honors. Pacific for the Pacific. I want to gather with you and I want to say, what do we know? What do we know about our place, our ocean? What do we know from a law perspective? What do we know from a gender perspective? What do we know from a cultural perspective? What do we know about managing fisheries? What can we learn from our communities? And can we bring it together to create a voice for change? in the same way that the Pacific got 1.5 degree long-term temperature goal in the Paris Agreement against all odds. So I want a climate assessment for the Pacific by the Pacific. And that might help me solve my crisis of contradictions. So I'm not going to I hope you like this piece. She lies in front of us, opening her eyes so we may see the sun rise on the land which you and I now call mine. She lies in front of us, opening her mouth, breathing life to all creatures around. Yes, she lies in front of us, opening her body, gifting us with her mana, like overflowing liquid of blue gold, birthing a blue earth on island jewels where our ancestors sailed to find home. Yes, there she lies in front of us, caressing our bodies, her liquid feeding and flowing through us and around us. Her currents excite us, her changing tides ignite us, bringing new waves of Bringing you waves filled with energy, she is filled with so much mana, yet we underestimate our white tuli. Her flowing currents bring up microorganisms from the depths of the ocean, creating a motion of nutrients, feeding our fish of the deep sea all the way to our coral reefs, where our women in fisheries now go out to chest deep, all because of global warming. Look, our sea levels rising taking responsibility to catch fish feeding to feed their matangali, breaking our hearts completely to see plastic pollution flowing in you so freely, one day suffocating you and me, creating a plastic human biology in a society already filled with plastic policies who give no apologies for violating your spirit with their so-called new sustainable technologies. How dare they? 
How dare they surf your waves on massive polluted vessels we don't see every day and it's not okay. Our Pacific Ocean is not for play, not for you to bring your toys into the BBNJ and rape her purity away, leaving her and her people dying, dying silently. What a monstrosity it would be to extract minerals from areas connected to our seas, only to heal the rich and have our Pacific peoples die out and bleed, never mind it came from our seas. And you call yourselves stewards of the sea? What a hypocrisy. Now, there she lies, toxicity, tears of toxicity, screaming waves so violently, destroying our islands, her body has been violated because you stood there silently. No sun rising as she opens her eyes. No breath of life, mouth dead open wide. No body to gift our children's children with her mana. Soon we will be called the dead Pacific seas all because we weren't strong enough to stand up to our own societies. So let's unite our Pacific Oceans and gain some clarity to be better stewards of these big ocean states, to bring justice to our white Tui that has connected you to me and me to you in a kinship so strong. Let's not be silent as she bleeds for you and me. Thank you. What a privilege it is to come after such a powerful spoken word poet. And trust me, I'm very critical. I think that was awesome. <laughs> There's a Samoan proverb that translates into, the offspring of birds are fed with flower nectar, but the children of men are nurtured with words. Those who know me know that I have a preoccupation with words. And so I thought um, that tonight, the contribution that I might make from the humanities would be a series of provocations in the hope that these provocations might stimulate some new ways of thinking about the blue economy and other related concepts. Thank you so much to the organizers for the invitation to contribute to the panel. Um, I acknowledge the wealth of knowledge shared by my panel panelists and our lovely moderator. I am an academic. You will have to flag me down. I can talk for two hours. <laughs> But what I intend to do is to provide, when I looked at the panel, let's start from that. When I looked at the lineup and I thought, oh, okay, the science, and okay, Maureen's there, and she's a fellow angry native sister too. But how can I contribute to this conversation that may well become extremely scientific? I've been pleasantly surprised and heartwarmed that it hasn't. Um, and that the science has been extremely informing in a very easy to consume way. Um, such a beautiful uh, conversation so far. So thank you for that opportunity. But I thought, I spent some time thinking, how can I contribute to this? Um, and so what I intend to do is to provide three entry points or provocations. Um, and what I mean by this is I'd like to unpack the political layers as well as the power relationships between within the dominant mainstream paradigm or ways of thinking about these conceptual frameworks such as the blue economy and sustainable development. So the three main points or provocations I'll focus on are, one, the blue economy like all other mainstream concepts and ideas about the good life, the common good, are conceptualized and developed in the global north within their systems, promoting their values, their aspirations and for their interests. What it means is that this is ultimately a conversation about the inherent racism of our current systems. It is about power and agencies. Two, the blue economy emerges from a global conversation about sustainability that is driven by economic values. Values which are in direct tension with our indigenous ideas and understandings of human ecology and which contradicts specific notions of sustainability. Three, if we are genuinely interested in generating meaningful public discourse, not academic closeted discourse, but meaningful public discourse about the blue economy and about sustainability, we need to seriously think about two emerging issues or ideas, and these are symbolic environmental politics and the politics of simulation. 
and I will talk a little bit about these later. Our education systems and research must unpack these into the language of the people to allow for real conversations that everyone can engage in. And finally, within these discussions of education and research, we must recognize the central role of civil society, which act as mediators to help mobilize public movements and resistance where necessary. So provocation one. Let's start with my first provocation that the blue economy and all other mainstream ideas about the good life are part of an inherently racist system which perpetuates specific power relationships. I began working in the area of education for sustainable development around late 2005-2006 as part of a larger USB effort. From an intellectual perspective, early on, we realized that we were having very different conversations when we talked about sustainability across the different regions. Um, when we talked about sustainability, sustainable development, and education for sustainable development. And we recognized the politics of the dominant economic paradigm. And so when Elizabeth showed the, the three pillars, the constant argument, where is culture? And how can we continue to have siloed conversations with the economists in one room and the scientists talking about environment in another room and no one really thinks that the humanities has anything to offer because culture, like what? So at the same time, some of us were torn between the desire to reframe and rename versus wanting to rethink and change from within the conversation. So the ESD work that began 13 years ago provided an opportunity to interrogate what sustainable development and sustainability means to Pacific peoples themselves. This important undertaking led to a wide range of exploratory uh, research into indigenous ideas about custodianship and the critical role within the broader sustainability thinking movement. Fast forward to 2012, my own doctoral study in Samoan Tonga found that relationality is enacted through our conceptual understanding and agency of the va, or relational space. It is not a metaphor for relationship. It is a life philosophy that is underpinned by a very complex value system, values which are premised on a worldview or standpoint of connectedness and holism. The va or relational space exists among people, between humans and the ancestors, our human ecology, the wider cosmos and the gods. In this framework, the va presents an entry point for a deeper, more difficult conversation about what spirituality is not religion. And you might be wondering, but what does this have to do with the blue economy? The intention of the blue economy, we are told, is that of sustainable development. And so before I move into that, I want to take a moment to reflect on what we have collectively learned about what it means to us as Pacific people. I'll only just share a few examples. So the idea of the good life, as I've said, in Samoa and Tonga, living in balance and harmony, we talk about the va. Similar echoes are found in the spiritual valued, uh, values in indigenous communities where research has been conducted, including the Solomon Islands, Rambi, Vanuatu, Rotuma, Fiji, Australia, and Hawaii, to name just a few that have been written on. What is very clear is that the world has much to learn from indigenous ways of knowing sustainability and being sustainable. Unfortunately, the Western world, having caught on, has now embarked on another extractive industry, that of research. We're all aware of the post-colonial legacy of our imported systems that are conceptualized and driven by the global north, but what we and our leaders fail to articulate is the inherent racism of our systems, our institutions, our laws, our policies, our curriculum, and yes, even our research. There is at the core of all systems and institutions at play today an epistemological racism which privileges a particular body of knowledge, mainstream knowledge from elsewhere that marginalizes or silences alternative ways of knowing and being in the world. These mainstream knowledge systems are premised, developed, and implemented using values that are not our own. Provocation two, just as development models and sustainable development models privilege the economic paradigm, 
we see the environmental or ecological platform reduced to a capitalist resource based that is there to be exploited and utilized for human consumption. This is contrasted by our cultural ideas about custodianship and the value of the earth, land, sky, and sea taken holistically as critical to our identity as humans, full stop. Not for economic activity, full stop. This notion of being and connectedness has no place in development models, frameworks, and culture is relegated to the sidelines. At worst, culture is a barrier to development. At best, it is a vector for development, but always, always privileging development and the economic standpoint or power base. As Buga 2017 argues, the meaning of a concept lies in its use. It is in its consistent or persistent use of that concept or word that gives it power and meaning. Concepts are then a result of an agreement of shared values. Unpacking the genealogy of the concept of the blue economy, it's really interesting to note the emphasis on business models in the original Pauli report of 2010 that everyone references. Not surprising, it focused on sustainable development that was meant to sustain economic interests and efficiency. Rio Plus 20 shifted focus slightly towards conservation and sustainable management of marine and coastal resources in support of sustainable development and poverty eradication. Sounds positive. The use of the term resources is telling of the underpinning economic value base. Similarly, the ongoing use of the word capital adds to this point, cultural capital, social capital, cultural economy, all point to economic values. We talk about knowledge societies and knowledge economy. The European Union 2012, European, sorry, the EU Commission by developing a sustainable, thriving blue economy in a secure and environmentally sustainable way. The aim is wealth creation. They're very clear on that. Writing on the Pacific, Dorman and others 2018 provide insight into the green growth and blue, sorry, and blue green economy in the Pacific. And they say that their findings are that the blue green economy discourse in the region is yes, a contested policy space, but Pacific actors seem to be deploying competing meanings of green growth in ways that both reflect their own worldviews and their specific agendas, and that this has helped underpin the rapid spread of green growth terminology in the region that's quite different from international usage. The usage in the Pacific draws on a different kind of symbolism that alludes to the Pacific Ocean identities in line with how offers our sea of islands and his assertion, we are the ocean, the ocean is in us. Provocation three. The danger of symbolic environmental politics and the performative art of simulation politics. The 2017 Blue Pacific Framework endorsed by Pacific leaders asserts the Blue Pacific identity to do two things. One, recapture the collective potential of the ocean's shared stewardship of the Pacific Ocean based on an explicit recognition of its shared ocean identity, ocean geography, and ocean resources. And secondly, to reaffirm the connections of Pacific people with their natural resources, environment, culture, and livelihoods. The blue Pacific identity succeeds in providing what looks to be a balanced concept that captures Pacific ways of seeing and belonging. But given what we know of the encroachment of the extractive industries in the region, how much of this blue economy discourse and blue Pacific identity is in fact symbolic politics? The main re three regional reference points which push the blue ocean analogy are the blue Pacific, the blue economy, and more recently, the blue continent. If we think about the politics of language, we recognize that discourse is about power. And this multi-layered power play is seen in the language of choice, one, English, and two, the content of discourse. And so my final provocation comes from the psychology of politics and the power of subliminal messaging used to brainwash and condition, using the media and propaganda as instruments of distractive communication. 
The subliminal messaging in our bluing of the Pacific Ocean can be seen in two ways. On the one hand, it's part of this movement that is wonderful to rethink and reclaim and rename and reassert our identities as ocean states or big ocean islands rather than small island states. The more we use it, we hear it, and we apply it in everyday language, in policy, education, and research, we begin the critical re-education process of decolonization of the mind through reverse subliminal messaging. Some scholars argue that symbolic politics may be used as distractors to commitment and promises for which there is no intention of ever fulfilling. They argue that these forces are beyond government's control, which actually restricts their capacity for coordinated, sustained, and eco-political action. I'm mindful of time, so I will cut this short, but I'm drawn to Matt in 2003, who talks about substantial symbolic content that prescribes a certain regulatory intent of the government. In his un unpacking, he talks about government dancing between two main stakeholder groups. On the one hand, the public or general electorate, and on the other, corporate or business interests. In this system, the role of symbolic politics is clarified as a means by which to appease the masses, while at the same time ensuring that the relationship to economic interests is never threatened. We see positive uses of symbolic politics in integration and communication, where symbols help to create greater awareness, acceptance, and engagement. And in the communication of abstract scientific concepts, Negatively, however, it may be used to disguise true intentions, mask uncertainty, or distract from otherwise costly undertakings. Looking at the outcomes document of the Pacific SIDS Regional Training and Capacity Building Workshop of Deep Seabed Mining held in Tonga this year, it's really interesting to see the participation of deep green metals and nautilus minerals, which I'm sure Maureen will touch on, which they have a checkered history in the region. Then there is the fact that our leaders have in principle endorsed a draft mining code which would allow commercial mining of the international seabed for the first time of just under 50% of the Earth's surface. Keeping in mind that blue Pacific identity, it's a struggle to not see the probability of symbolic environmental politics at play. Perhaps a more sinister view is that of performative nature of simulation politics, where there is a deliberate juxtaposition of the ideal versus the real to the point that we are no longer able to see reality as it actually is. So what we're talking about in this sinister model is carefully curated performance and repeated use, strategically applying simulation political acts in the same way that subliminal messaging works. If you take, for instance, these conversations about blue Pacific identity, blue economy, and blue continent, it is a rebranding of the Pacific. There is a marketing agenda, and we are drawn to the blue when they are very clearly about economic agendas. If you take the SPREP two-page document, Valuing the Ocean, Pacific Blue Economy, clear alignment with SDGs presenting 14 key points related to the blue economic sector. Only one of the 14 points raised on research shifts focus away from economic value. Everywhere there is mention of conservation, it is conservation for improved economic activity. So from a sociological perspective, it's interesting to observe how we are appeased by a perceived political will to safeguard and protect, to pursue climate justice and ocean sustainability. I think sometimes we're distracted by the symbols that we crave. Symbols that point to our connectedness and place that emphasize spirituality and the desire for meaning and purpose. And so what I really want to know is, are we so distracted by what we want to see that we are in fact blinded to the extractive and exploitative agenda of development and economics right in front of us? I end with a little snippet. Three years ago, I was invited to the Green Growth Leaders Coalition convened by IUCN, supported by Australian-funded Pacific Leadership Program. The purpose of that was to create a safe space of like-minded actors to discuss green growth and sustainable development. It was here at this retreat that I was introduced to the green-blue economy discourse. 
and I listened to various political leaders. I was skeptical of the new terms, but gained such a deep respect of the thinking that I had seen in that safe space, something I'd never been privy to, I had never been privy to before. It was a privilege to listen to their internal struggles, trying to juggle and manage and negotiate local aspirations and global agendas. I do not think our political leaders are fully aware of the symbolic environmental politics or simulation politics at play. Whatever the agenda or illusion, one thing is clear, we do need to be vigilant. If we are interested in social justice and achieving the resilient societies and ecologies we crave, we must integrate these concepts. We must have these hard conversations. We must name the political giants and monsters in the room in our space. And we do need education, research, and civil society to lead that movement. For me, this is what Epeli meant when he said, we are the sea and the ocean. We must wake to this ancient truth and use it to overturn all hegemonic views that aim ultimately to confine us again, physically and psychologically. We must not allow anyone to belittle us and take away our freedom. I hope I have provoked you. And as always, it's a tough act to follow. <laughs> Um, it's an amazing panel to be sharing the space with, and it's, a, it's wonderful to see so many familiar faces in this struggle. I'm going to try, because everyone has pretty much said what I need to say. So I'm just going to emphasize where emphasis is needed, call out where it needs to be called out, and push us just a little bit more to be a little bit more particular about language. My interest in blue economy has consistently about language and language development, particularly in policy spaces. How does two innocuous words marry them? Blue economy, the innocuous. How do we understand it? Where does it come from? Who speaks it? How does it take shape, form? How do we recognize it? How does it manifest itself in terms of its politics, structures, etc.? Like many of my panel um, fellows here, I came across these two innocuous words um, in Rio at the, the, Rio, um, the World Summit. And this was in 2012. And again, it was a framing of around blue-green. And then someone said, well, what about brown economy? So you could get lost in the colors of the economy. So it was like blue, green, brown, and then, you know, I've just looked at an EU paper put out yesterday. There's orange, there's purple. And so we could get lost in the color. What started to really concern me when you look at the evolution of, of development of these two words, the things that really caught me and gave me pause was when people begin to qualify these two words. So they add sustainable blue economy. The famous, our very famous Peter Thompson says that he cannot say the words blue economy without qualifying it with the word sustainable. Then I see further iterations of these two words. People-centered, people-led, people-driven, blue economy. So you know you're starting to be on a slippery, slidey slope by this point, because the real key is the word economy and growth. As Francis clearly points out, it is what we are trying to constrain, which we haven't done well at all. And so, so for me today, in the policy world of oceans, <laughs> you cannot move without bumping into the word blue. We are so blued out right now that I feel like we need to start a campaign to save the color blue <laughs> and the word blue from the kinds of violations of adding economy to it. But that's a distraction. What I want to say in terms of iterations around this push for this language is it's a signal. And this is my first emphasis. It's a signal that 
clearly tells us that there is a trend around acceleration and expansion of ocean activities. And really, the words for that is industrialization of oceans. That's what it is. In its most explicit, we should call it that, industrialization. But the policy lens indicates that it is an acceleration in preparation and an expansion of human activities on this blue body of water. That's my first emphasis. Um, as an organization, when we first came across this word, my staff really do, because I'm quite pedantic about language in policy development stuff. And so I have this pet peeve, we have to understand it. Our lens of understanding it has been on resources, deep sea mineral resources in particular, fisheries, and most recently we've just added infrastructure, which is an enabling environment. It's an enabling, it's like a signal to say, we are now ready for this industrialization to take place. We are at this point, partly because we are told the narrative that new technology is now making it possible for us to begin this exploitation. The narrative is all about job opportunities and competitive advantage. When you think about framing, this part of the world that we occupy was always described as underdeveloped and underexploited. And so that makes it interesting when you're really trying to give shape, form, and understand that. Um, I will not go into definitions. I will not go into the key components, except the blue is that. It's bodies of water, lakes, rivers, oceans, seas. The economy co components, a lot of people have touched on it. I want to talk about the new and emerging components of this. And just to highlight that, the trend that we need to contest is really around commodification. And it's around what we call environmental services and products which we can then buy and sell and trade on international markets. And I think we are now that particular trend we need to emphasize. We have to have discussions. And though I am really grateful to understand the role of the ocean in terms of a carbon sink and our ability to put numbers, we need to decide whether we want to go down in terms of commodification of all things, including life-giving planetary functions of the ocean. Is that where we want to go? But it's a trend in which we need to discuss the, around commodification of services, life-giving services of the oceans. We are now have products, blue carbon being one of them. I want to pick up a little bit on culture and identity. Because I think this is really the cautionary tale for this part of the region, of the world. And I really, really, um, I don't want to elaborate too much, but except to say this, we know that the appropriation is already taking place and we need to call it. We've seen an appropriation of this thing called the uniqueness of our specific people, A, in terms of identity, relationship, these are quite, again, they really flag the appropriation because we've seen it in mining, seabed mining. And in fact, the Cook Islands put out a document rationalizing how to start seabed mining in the Cook Islands based on this indigenous understanding and frameworks to say and to use our custodianship and responsibilities to therefore manage it well. So the appropriation of these cultural aspects that mean so much to Pacific people is already taking place. We see that reflected in the Pacific Islands Forum Palau Declaration, 
again, using a Peli Haofa, persuading us, but at the same time, pushing for the lowest environmental standards to allow seabed mining to go ahead. The blue narrative, the blue identity, this blue continent, and the essence of what it is, is already being appropriated to allow us to begin exploitation over it. That's my second emphasis. I want to say that right now, the interest is really phenomenal. And if you want to know anything about blue economy, the EU has the blue growth strategy, China has the maritime Silk Road strategy, the Commonwealth has the blue charter, the World Bank has blue growth, and most recently the EU and the World Bank have the blue economy development framework, building resilience to climate change bringing us directly into the crisis of contradictions. Because, and as I've said, my third emphasis, we're at crossroads. Under the green economy framework, which is an attempt to balance economic, social, and environment, we have failed. And our planetary crisis tells us that we have failed. Whether you're looking at it from a biodiversity lens, energy crisis, food crisis, and most of all the climate change crisis, we are failing because we have not learned to constrain economy, economics, economic growth models that we keep persisting. And, it, and you can see it roll over into the blue economy. So now we are prepared to exploit in a different environment, we have significant challenges. So I only want to just wrap up by saying the following. For all Pacific Islanders, um, we are now the site of extreme interest. Different actors, players, transnational corporations, governments, multi it doesn't matter, international financial institutions, we are now the site of extreme interest. We should expect to see an acceleration of ocean industrial activities. We should expect that. Once they have these things in place, policy, structures, ports, roads, airports, all in preparation to facilitate the blue economy. We need to be very clear that our agency in terms of culture, identity, stewardship, guardianship, and responsibilities attached to it is already being appropriated. You need to take a stand and fight to defend what it is to mean a Pacific Islander today using that framework. We should expect to see conflicts around resource and resource exploitation, mining, seabed mining. The behaviors of transnational corporations, our governments, international institutions, the revolving doors makes it highly contested, highly contested. The kinds of behaviors of the International Seabed Authority, our own crop agencies here, and our governments is quite shocking. And there's enough evidence around where we can expect conflict to be. I don't want to elaborate except to say two last things. Emphasis. We need to consider this movement around giving the ocean rights. If it's a living entity, if it's a life-giving entity, her rights are being violated in ways, shapes that even we don't understand. We have to consider, as the region that owns the largest ocean and takes to its trip responsibilities really strong, we have to begin to give her her rights not just for ourselves, not just for future generation, but for the whole world. 
because that is our gift to the world if we can leverage this right and her identity and the protection of it. I want to say that we need to get into collective efforts. Scientists, lawyers, economists, activists, indigenous peoples, artists, we have to. We are now clearly located in a time where they are coming for these resources and the clever trickery with words will catch us. In fact, they're catching us. And so the need for collective actions, resistance, is so much more important today than it ever has been. And I'll just end at that. 